some people, I can't imagine why, think it's rather rude. But um, I, I wouldn't know, of course. We're going to look at the Sentinel, which is the name it's known by. I know it as the Australian Cruiser Mark I. It's actually a, quite a, an unusual tank and a very rare tank even to see at Bovington. The reason the Australians built a tank was because for a long time, during the early part of the Second World War at least, it looked as if they weren't going to get any, either from Britain or from any of the Commonwealth countries that were building tanks. So they decided to build a tank of their own. Australian made, every last nut and bolt of them. From a lowly beginning spring Australia's armoured fighting vehicles. It's a remarkable achievement. It meant they had to build a factory to make them in. It meant they had to get all the bits together and design the tank themselves. And really, in those days, with the state of industry as it was then, that itself was quite an achievement. And this tank is the, the result, and it's a very interesting tank. The hull is all cast. You'll see that when you look at it. It's all made up of castings. They couldn't do welding. They didn't have the right sort of plate out there, so they decided a casting would be the answer. That means you can't really control the weight quite so well as you can with a welded tank, and still it, it was quite an achievement in its day. Um, we'll, we'll overlook the front machine gun position because some people, I can't imagine why, think it's rather rude. But um, I, I wouldn't know, of course. But uh, that's it. It has a Vickers 303 water-cooled machine gun mounted inside it, which is quite something when you think about it. And it means that the tank's a five-man tank. It's got two blokes in the front and three more in the turret. Now you'll notice that although the turret is cast, it's very much after the shape of the turrets on the British cruisers with that outward side to it and the undercut bit down the bottom. And that was done to give the guys inside a little bit more elbow room because it is quite a cramped turret. The two-pounder in those days was virtually the only gun available. Quite a good anti-tank gun in its day, but this tank could take a much larger gun, as I'll tell you in a minute. Now, it really was quite an ingenious machine in many ways, built with a lot of originality. The only advice they were getting at the time was from a Frenchman, a Monsieur Perrier, who gave them some advice on the suspension and on the layout of the engine. And apart from that, most of it is indigenous Australian design. So it really is quite remarkable. That's the basic structure of the tank. Now the engine, they had a real problem with. They had no big enough engine to drive the tank along. So what this Frenchman Perrier suggested was a triple layout of Cadillac V8s. It's three engines of about 100 horsepower each, all arranged to drive into a single five-speed gearbox near the front. And it's quite odd. It's described as a clover leaf formation because you've got two engines on the flanks that um, are a bit further forward. And then the central one is mounted a wee bit further back. So the three of them look like a clover leaf looked at from above. And that's how they arranged the tank. So you had an engine effectively of about 330 horsepower. And it was just about enough to push this thing along. The other thing that really makes for French um, interest in the design is the suspension. They wanted originally to use the M3 suspension as on the M3 Grant. And they decided in the end that they'd take the advice of Monsieur Perrier. And what they developed was a suspension which is, it's like the American suspension because it has the broad rollers and the rubber block track, but the actual brackets are much more like you'll find on the Hotchkiss H35. And uh, that's why it's designed like it is. It's quite unusual, and it means you've got the Hotchkiss type suspension, or a French suspension, on what is otherwise an Australian tank. It's got front mounted drive sprockets like the American tanks, um, because the gearbox is at the front as well. But that's how the tank's laid out inside. It really is quite an amazing layout, the use of triple Cadillac engines. I remember years ago when I lived in Australia, 
being told by a chap who'd been in the Australian Royal Engineers that when the program for these tanks was cut, the Cadillac engines were a glut on the market. You could get V8 Cadillacs for a song and they used them in graders and all kinds of things. I, I never really investigated the truth of that, but that's what I was told. Um, the whole tank weighs about 28 tonnes. It's got a top speed of about 30 miles an hour, which really isn't too bad. The Australians in the end built 66 of these. They were never used operationally at all. As far as I know, they never left Australia, apart from this one and the one which is now in the USA, I don't think any others have even left the country. They're quite a, an unusual vehicle. This one could be described as in mink condition. Apart from the fact it's probably still got a few red-back spiders um, crawling about inside it, I don't think it's ever been moved since it got here. And it would make an interesting tank to see running one day. But uh, if it's running, it means it's put in the motor and the moving collection and we don't get to show it in the museum. And I think this tank needs displaying because uh, although people are sometimes just a bit rude about that front machine gun position, the um, tank generally is actually quite an interesting one. Um, as I say, they tried to develop it. After a while, they developed the Mark III. The Mark II was a design which never got anywhere. They developed the Mark III and because they hadn't, the six pounder wasn't available at the time, they fitted it with a 25 pounder. And then they decided to go up a stage further and they fitted one with a 17 pounder anti-tank gun, which is quite remarkable. Great big gun sticking out the front. And in order to test the tank for recoil, firing a heavy gun like a 17 pounder, they actually mounted one with twin 25 pounders, which is quite a, a sight if you get to see it a tank with two guns, and that was done to test the recoil. It, what it basically means is that this tank, the AC-1, started off with a two-pounder, ended up with a 17-pounder. It's the only tank in the British um, sort of influence that I can think of that had that ability to use any one of those guns. The 17-pounder appeared as a prototype. There was only ever the one and uh, it, it was done away with because really, by that time, the Australians had realised that they weren't going to need these tanks. They were used in Australia for training, and once, and only once, they appeared in a movie painted up as German tanks with crosses on them because nobody else but the Australians knew what they were. And um, otherwise, they, they faded from the scene after roughly after the Australians were built 60, 60 plus of them, and. Uh, didn't build any more. So when that was um, over, they then started to receive tanks mainly from America, Grants, Stuarts, and Shermans later on. And that was much more in keeping with what everybody else was using, not these things. But it's a pity because it is an interesting vehicle and one that I think would have played quite a vital part in its day if it had been used in action. And I'd recommend anybody who comes here to have a look at this tank and see the unusual layout of it. Thanks for watching that. If you've enjoyed it, then if you care to, subscribe to the uh, YouTube channel because that will help a lot. But also support us on Patreon. Thanks very much. That's not a can of Fosters on the back, by the way. It's meant for um, carrying extra fuel. So... Uh, just so you know.